This is the Siemens S70 streetcar. It's our current design for streetcars revitalizing America's cities. The streetcar is not a step back to the past, but is instead a leap forward as the modern connector of today's livable cities. RNP Jajorian believes regional transit is vital to the success of the Sacramento region and is proud to support this Viewfinder episode. There is more vehicle miles traveled in California than Florida and New York combined in every single day. You're stuck in traffic, you look next to you, and the one thing you have in common is everybody is one person in a car. How do we change that? If you're from the West, like many of us out here are, there's a certain connection to being in a car and, and driving and having that independence. Whether you travel four or 40 miles each day, chances are how you get around and the time it takes to get there will soon be changing. We can all move around better, we can build better communities, we can build a better future if we have more traveling options. We're seeing a real shift in how people want to get around. With 3.6 million people expected to live in the six-county Sacramento region by mid-century and 50 million in the state of California, many are asking, how will we all get around? We'll look at transportation challenges and the growing options around our region, including trends that could shape the way we move and change the way we live. For the past half century, the way the average person has traveled from one place to another hasn't changed all that much. In my career, in my life, I've gone through decade after decade of transportation without hardly any innovation on the passenger side. But now, Dan Sperling says that's changing. He's the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. For the past quarter century, the Institute has been exploring everything from sustainable transportation solutions to travel behavior to pavement. This is a very exciting time right now and a very important time. We are seeing three new sets of innovations that are all transformational. Sperling says the last time the nation saw this much change on the passenger side of transportation was when the interstate highway was born. In Sacramento, that year was 1961. Where you see the construction on the 29th Street Freeway or the future route of 99E, it's well along. While construction was underway on the interchange between Business 80 and Highway 99, another plan called for building Interstate 5 alongside the Sacramento River. This is probably the most controversial area in the whole freeway problem because of the historical buildings involved. Here, just like all over America, when the interstate highway system was built, they really destroyed a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of downtowns because they ran the freeways right down, right down the throat of the downtown, that would never happen today. That road would never be allowed to bisect downtown today. But the growth of the highway system meant more people living in bigger houses on larger lots farther away from the urban core. That rapid suburban growth created thousands of new longer distance commuters and a steady increase in traffic congestion, air pollution, and driver frustration it became clear that Northern California couldn't travel this congested path much longer. There was definitely a region-wide awakening that where we're headed is the wrong direction. In 2002, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, or SACOG, began looking at the future of regional transit. We did the first really long-range serious study about the connections between the land use patterns and the transportation patterns and concluded that we were doing it wrong, that we were growing ever outward as nearly every other American metropolitan area in the country and that that was creating a challenge for the transportation network which was simply not solvable. The challenge, in a rapidly growing region, how do you add more people when there's just one primary way for them to travel? with input from thousands of participants around the region, SACOG released their blueprint, a projection of how the six counties in the Sacramento region would look if the current growth continued. Mike McKeever was SACOG director. It was a very, uh, and I say this proudly, a very disruptive planning process. In that, we had an honest conversation. We didn't 
pull any punches, we didn't hide any facts. We gave them the information and then we asked them, we designed an interactive exercise for them to deal with that information and tell us what they thought the future of their neighborhood and then their county and then the whole region should be given that information. For many, it was an eye-opening look at what might happen to the region if nothing was done to prepare for growth. The headline in the Bee the next day was, SACOG shows the region the road to ruin. But the blueprint, adopted in 2004, set the Sacramento region on what planners now say is a smarter path to growth. A key component, more mixed land use, where schools, parks, businesses, and different sizes and styles of homes are integrated in the same neighborhoods and communities. McKeever says the research shows baby boomers and millennials in particular want it all in close proximity. It's all about choices that allow each individual to make the optimum decision. And what we found through the research is when you put the living patterns together with the transportation choices, they just need cars much less. Sophia Mercado lives two miles from her job near the state capitol. And while she owns a car, she says it's easier and cheaper to find other ways to get to work, like riding a bike or taking Uber. It's a really nice way to start your day, and just the fact that you're not paying for parking or dealing with the congestion in a car is really nice. I don't see cars as being looked at as a status symbol anymore. Mercado would have to pay $12 for daily parking in downtown Sacramento. It's only $4.17 for her to take an Uber, and bicycling costs nothing. I don't have to worry about the five to 10 minutes it takes to find a parking spot. Literally, you go, you get there, and you get out and get in. So it's really convenient. The savings is a small portion of why you do it. The convenience, um, the peace of mind. No one likes to start their day stressed out in a car. Another non-car option, expanding Sacramento's streetcar system. Although federal funding is uncertain, the hope is to connect West Sacramento to downtown, the rail yards, and Old Sacramento over a 3.3 mile route. There will also be a bike share program in Sacramento, West Sac, and Davis. Bike share allows a rider to hop on in one spot, ride across town, and drop the bike off at another location. Both options are successfully being used in other cities. Yeah, we are definitely seeing a change in transportation preferences um, away from having your own car. Uh, a lot of millennials in particular, but also a, a lot of our seniors who are, are downsizing or, or they want to live in the urban core, they want better options. And they're using things like Uber, they're biking, they're walking, they want to use transit. And we know we have to do a better job of making transit make, meet those 21st century needs. West Sacramento has for years been cut off by the river, the highway, and the rail line. Now they've invested in an improved bike infrastructure, along with a modern transit center that will soon be a bike share stop and the west end of the streetcar line. It's really about making it possible for people to drive less. For all that to happen, experts say the conversation must return to housing. Kate White is Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy and Housing Coordination for the California State Transportation Agency. She's walking the walk, literally. White is possibly the first and only deputy transportation secretary not to own a car. Housing and transportation are inseparable. Basically every trip, when the beginning of your day, starts at your home. And ideally you're not going too far for your job or your daily uh, needs. So we don't have to provide so much transportation. We're not going to be building a bunch of new roads in California anymore. We want to be able to provide housing closer to where people work and recreate. In West Sacramento, several new high-density housing projects are in various stages of completion, with jobs, recreation, shopping, and transportation all close together. People always think, oh, the housing is so expensive you know, in urban areas, so prices are going up. But if you count in not owning a car, you have tremendous savings. AAA says it's about $10,000 a year for a household to own and operate a car. Ellie Steele says it's not as hard as you might think. She gave up her car, along with a $500 monthly car payment, five years ago, and she hasn't looked back. 
I had sort of a mind shift where I decided instead of, you know, biking if I could, I was going to go the direction of if I could bike there, I would. Little by little, I started finding more routes. I started finding bike lanes or bike paths that I wasn't aware of or just a different neighborhood to go through that felt a lot more comfortable. So the world just sort of opened up. Steele has a cargo bike that she uses for grocery shopping, getting to work, and picking up the kids from school. And yes, she has kids. You got it? Steele says it's just as natural for five-year-old Lennon and eight-year-old Theo to strap on a helmet as it is for most of us to buckle a seatbelt. A few years ago, we were, we were rare. People would stop us on the streets and ask us about our bikes and ask us what we were doing, if we were crazy. And at this point, I see other families riding around and I don't know them, and that's kind of exciting to me. Steele admits a car-free lifestyle doesn't come entirely without its challenges. The issue a lot of times is connectivity, and so you have a nice bike lane or you have a nice bike path, but then suddenly you have a freeway on-ramp that you have to deal with, and that can be really complicated and really scary if you don't know how to get around. State and local officials are trying to address those issues, making bike lanes a bigger part of the transportation puzzle, and adding features like bright green paint to make them safer, more visible, and easier to use. In downtown Sacramento, where parking can be expensive and hard to find, bikes prove to be one of several options for people visiting the new Golden One Center. When it was announced it was moving from North Natomas to the center of downtown, there were a lot of people that were like, how on earth is that going to work? That is going to be a transportation nightmare. People in the transportation business said, no, that's exactly where you want it because you can serve it with existing transit. I think for the Sacramento Police Department, we found when the opening of Golden One occurred, everyone was worried about traffic. It was supposed to be Carmageddon. As it turned out, many people avoided potential traffic gridlock by riding their bikes, finding prepaid parking, and using light rail. And for most, it worked. We've had virtually no problems from day one. Now, the city did a lot of smart things to prepare. RT deserves some kind of prize for what they did to get ready to deliver first class service on day one. But it, it proves that getting people closer together and that allows you to bring more transportation options is the sweet spot. But many people are still reluctant to use light rail, fearing it's unsafe. Sacramento Regional Transit responded by increasing security. Good afternoon. Have your tickets up. They now have 29 sworn police officers and 33 inspection staff. They also added six more light rail trains and extended service during major events. I think for regional transit employees and, and for everyone involved in the arena, it was really exciting to see new riders um, testing the system out. I think has been really a fulfillment of a lot of effort to really transform uh, regional transit to something that is a viable option. Right now, RT carries approximately 10% of attendees to and from any given event. Now efforts are focused on increasing ridership, not just to the Golden One Center, but throughout the region. We need to do the best job possible we can. For example, to make our system more clean, more safe, and more convenient. I use light rail approximately five times a week, starting approximately eight o'clock in the morning, and probably till about seven o'clock in the evening when I get off work. Keith Peoples has been a regular RT rider for the past seven years. He used to take four buses along with light rail just to get to work. Today he's riding a different line, followed by another bus to head to a doctor's appointment. So I catch the 75 out to Mather, I'll go to my doctor's appointment. I'll catch the 75 back to Matherfield Mills, hop back on light rail. The total time is about an hour from my house from Center Parkway to Matherfield Mills. Peoples is now within walking distance to one of the newest light rail stations. The extension of the RT line to the south area has saved him hours of commute time each week. Within the next 10 years, Sacramento Regional Transit CEO Henry Lee hopes to expand their system by 50 percent, eventually reaching communities like Elk Grove and important hubs like Sacramento International Airport. The benefit to the community will double. From the ridership perspective, we will try to double our ridership. 
And in the meantime, the value to the whole community will double. Where light rail won't be going, ever, is right to your front door. It's known as the first mile, last mile challenge. Most people live a mile or two away from a public transit station. So in order to use public transit, they still need to get to the station. Sacramento RT is hoping to address that with more buses that reach more homes. One of the major initiatives in the next two years we're going to do is redesign where we should put our bus in routes and how we can better collect our buses to the light rail. The bus should be really you know, the feeder system to the light rail system. That's what transportation experts call a multimodal solution, the use of two or more different modes of movement that overlap. For example, a commuter may ride the bus to the light rail station to bridge the first mile gap. If they have a mile or two on the back end of their commute, say, to reach their workplace, they could ride a streetcar or take advantage of the bike share program. There's another player on the scene, too, one that can go to your front door, and in fact is capable of servicing 75% of American homes. Not everybody is within walking distance of a transit location. So what we were seeing is people organically using Uber to meet that first and last mile need for them. As that progressed, we started talking to transit agencies and they saw a need for that as well. Hi. While some fear rideshare companies like Uber are competition for public transit, in Sacramento and a growing number of major cities, they're becoming more like partners. SACRT just launched a program called StationLink, where riders can get a discount on Uber, Lyft, or Yellow Cab for rides that begin or end at the light rail station. Studies are finding more and more young Americans are open to this type of commuting. I just like having the options. I like riding my bike. I think it's fun. I do it recreationally. Today, I rode my bike to the bus stop, and then I hopped on the bus, and it drops me off here at work. Then on my way home, I'm going to take the bus back to downtown and then ride my bike back home. When it rains, I'll drive. When it's nice, like today, I like to ride my bike. Not only is it convenient and fun and healthy, but it's also good for the environment. You know. Uh, myself, I think about my carbon footprint, and that's something, you know, on a daily basis uh, that helps guide my, some of my decisions, such as riding my bike. I think people's attachment to their car is diminishing. It's become much less of a status symbol. It's much less of a love affair. People now see it in a more functional way. You're finding more kids aren't trying to get their driver's license at 15 and a half, 16 years old. As that becomes more prevalent and this new generation is more open to transit, I think regional transit will expand and uh, be more um, the choice to commute. While today rideshare may make up less than 4% of transportation options, a J.P. Morgan Chase study says by 2030 that number will be closer to 25%. Uber reports right now across the U.S., 10% of their riders under the age of 30 say they've either given up their car or are no longer planning on buying one. Experts say millennials and future generations may be the game changers. They bring to the table an embrace of technology, of new ways of doing things, and a letting go of the old ways of doing things. It's not so important to them. So they are much more open to this idea of not having a car. They're much more open to using these different kinds of mobility services uh, in ways that us older folks uh, weren't. It's not a matter of coercing people to, to change. I think what we want to try to do is present folks with good, smart, viable options. In other words, nobody wants to sit in traffic all day. I don't, you don't, nobody does. So are there viable alternatives to get back and forth to work? Can we make public transit work better? Uh, would a high-speed rail system help? Brian Kelly oversees the California State Transportation Agency, or CALSTA, made up of seven different departments, including Caltrans, Amtrak, and the High Speed Rail Authority. California's transportation system is larger than any other state, with the most cars, the largest freeway network, and three of the five busiest passenger rail systems in the country. Yet Brian Kelly believes California can do better. Today in California, if you want to take a train, 
from Southern California to the Bay Area, it's a 12 hour trip. I mean, no business person can rely on that. But an under, under high speed rail will be less than three hours. Current passenger rail trains share the same lines with freight, which limits how fast they can go. But high speed rail will go more than 200 miles per hour. But the project still faces funding uncertainty and strong opposition. High speed rail has always been a challenge because even from the day it was approved by the voters in California, we didn't have enough money to build the whole system. So much like you build something like the BART system in the Bay Area or the light rail system in Sacramento, uh, you build it in phases. Kelly hopes the first phase will be operational by 2025. If it happens, it could eliminate more than 12 billion pounds of greenhouse gas emissions every year, the equivalent of taking one million cars off the road. You know, if we make no changes and you just go with business as usual, you're going to have more and more vehicular traffic, more and more pollution, and I think a lower and lower quality of life. I think if people are spending their time in traffic and cars are just emitting pollution, uh, you know, that's, that's no way to live. So I really think in a growing state, you've got to accommodate growth and you've got to do it by clean policies and good options. I think high-speed rail is the most transformative project we've seen in 30 years, no doubt about it. And remember, other countries around the world have already done it. Uh, we're catching up here, but California ought to be the first state doing it in America. I would call this ideal traffic scenario. It's 10 a.m., so you, we're, we're missing any major uh, commuting hour. Meet Andrew Zingali. He's a daily driver making the crowded drive from Oakland to Sacramento. Around any of the urban centers, Sacramento or out in the East Bay or even by Davis, um, then it gets pretty clogged. And even, even if traffic's moving, you're sort of just you know staying in your lane, staying behind the person in front of you. There's not a lot of options. While Zingali says he'd like to take advantage of public transportation, commuting by existing rail systems would take even longer than his three-hour daily ordeal. In addition to filling up about twice a week, the other costs are parking and, and then just regular maintenance on the vehicle, which now I have to get the oil changed and all of that a little bit more frequently. Even if you're taking Amtrak and other public transportation or using a bike, I still just think that would be such a challenge that you're better off having a car. Caltrans is the owner-operator of all the state highway systems. So the volume of people that we have today, we, we struggle as a state, especially in major metropolitan areas, to move people efficiently and effectively um, on any commute morning. Our population is going to grow from the 38 million we have today to probably 50 million in the next 20 years. So we not only have a challenge today, we have to pro try to meet tomorrow's challenge of moving 50 million people. We're not going to be able to build enough highways and enough traffic lanes to be able to move those people. Besides repairing roadway damage, Caltrans is also tasked with designing and improving roads and bridges to increase traffic flow. We're trying to enhance uh, our HOV system, high occupancy vehicles, move more people through the same corridor than we were before. We're also using hot lanes, toll lanes, where you can price the congestion to try to, again, maximize the throughput of those. We've got to make sure that the transportation system is connected as best as possible and that we've got capacity, the multimodal capacity, whether it's trains, whether it's buses, or uh, travel lanes for single vehicle cars, HOVs. We've got to use all those tools to try to overcome our challenges in the future. Caltrans also hopes to encourage more widespread use of electric and alternative fuel vehicles. It's a clear priority for Governor Jerry Brown, whose ambitious goal is having 15 percent of all cars sold in the state by 2025 be zero emission vehicles. Part of our role in that zero emission action plan is to try to fill some of the gaps of charging stations such that the electric vehicle becomes a more viable vehicle. And when it comes to electric and hydrogen vehicles, UC Davis transportation guru Dan Sperling says there are only three places in the world leading the efforts, Germany, Japan and California. Electrification is going to happen. It is happening. It's inevitable. It's just a superior technology in so many ways. Uh, it's quieter. Consumers, travelers like it. it it's, it's got a better driving feel to it. 
manufacturers like it because it simplifies the manufacturing of vehicles. You don't need as many platforms. It opens up the design envelope. You don't have that radiator and big engine. You can use the interior space. And most importantly, it's very efficient. No pollution, no greenhouse gases from the vehicle. While state and local agencies work to expand our network of transportation options, ultimately each of us will have to decide what works best. Thank you. With the $12 parking and then having to worry about your car getting hit or vandalized in the lot, it's just a smarter idea to just do Uber and not worry about that. Traffic's bad everywhere. Just running errands can be, a, you know, be a, a frustrating endeavor <laughs> because of that. I didn't want to be contributing to more uh, greenhouse gas pollution if I didn't have to. So it made me feel better to kind of remove ourselves out of that equation. You had a chance to just define your own journey in a powerful way. This is ground zero for these revolutions, is California for sure. California has always been a place where transformation happens. The challenges are real, but so is the wealth of innovation and new ideas, and the potential, once again, for our state and our region to lead the way, to ensure that the journey remains as important as the destination. RNP Jajorian believes regional transit is vital to the success of the Sacramento region and is proud to support this Viewfinder episode. This is the Siemens S70 streetcar. It's our current design for streetcars revitalizing America's cities. The streetcar is not a step back to the past, but is instead a leap forward as the modern connector of today's livable cities.